Good morning and welcome to Temple Church Faith University. Um, this morning's topic will be glory of the new covenant. And that is taken from um, 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 3. Um, we're going to be discussing verses um, 7 through 18. Um, our golden text today is also coming from 2 Corinthians 3. Um, that's chapter 3 and verse 17, which states, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Um, our first outline today that we're going to be discussing is the glory that is hidden. And that will be coming from um, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 3. And we're going to be discussing verses um, 7 through 11. Now, the old covenant um, that Israel um, was under... Uh, was built around um, what they say is the Mosaic laws that God had given to given the Israelites in the wilderness after their exodus from Egypt. Now, this old covenant law was binding until Christ came and ushered in the new covenant, which we are under today. The Jews were devoted to the law and cherished it which was the old covenant. Um, but there was one problem with that law, uh, which is um, referred to as the old covenant. It demanded absolute adherence and obedience to its provisions. The law itself showed the people their sin but it also provided atonement for them and forgiveness, but only in a limited way. It pointed ahead to God's ultimate solution for sin, but it did not provide that solution itself. Now, the new covenant, however, set aside the old and revealed the fullness of God's grace and his mercy. Can you imagine only being able to be forgiven for in, in a limited way that you had to wait until um, the time of atonement or you had to wait until um, someone actually, um, it was the time to go into the temple and you had to offer sacrifices and you had to actually wait until that person went into the temple and was able to be in the presence of God before um, your sins could um, be forgiven and you could go up for atonement. As much as we sin every day, and for those of you who think that you don't sin, your thoughts, the very thoughts that you think alone is sin without you even doing the act. Most of us don't even know that. If we could just have our thoughts on a picture some of the things that we think daily in our lives are, and some of the things that we do daily, some of the even the things that we say, um, we are sinning. Um, I'm reminded of the story in Acts um, chapter five and three of Anus and um, his wife, Sapphira. Now, they lied and told Peter that they had sold all of their possessions. First, it was Anus, um, and when he was positioned um, by Peter, he lied and said that they had basically sold all their possessions. At that time, um, Anus was struck dead. Then three hours later, um, Sephora was um, positioned, and she also lied and said that they had sold all of their possession, and they had not and she was struck dead can you even imagine from just telling um one little lie that um you would be struck dead um there was no do-overs there was no time for asking forgiveness they just felt dead can you even imagine that in today's world or in today's society falling dead 
after telling one lie or after just doing one sin? Since we could not satisfy the demands of the old covenant, Jesus fulfilled it for us and gave us the new covenant that reconciles us with God by grace and through faith. The new covenant is not about keeping a set of rules, but it's about trusting and loving the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be reading verses um, 7 through 11 in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. And the word of the Lord says, But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of the condemnation be glory, much more do the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of glory that excelled. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Now to explain the difference between the old and the new covenants, Paul makes a comparison that shows the superiority of the new over the old. Paul refers to the new covenant as the ministry, I'm sorry, Paul referred to the old covenant as the ministry of death that was carved in stone. The new covenant he referred to, on the other hand, is the ministry of the spirit and gives life. The old covenant was not bad or not evil but it was the law fulfilled god's intention for it was by showing people their inability um to please him and please him in their own but it revealed a personal sin and pointed to their needs for a savior because under the old law you couldn't be saved Paul called the old covenant the ministry of death because the law could only condemn and it had no saving power at that time trying to be obedient to the law was futile because no one was able to keep all of the commandments in the law. The law was God complete holiness and his righteousness that he required from us in the terms of being obedient to the law and not violating the law. Violating even one of the commandments constituted to violating the whole set of laws. This unity of the law was the reason for the new covenant. John um, states in 1 John 3 and 15 that one who hates his brother is considered a murderer. The same law that condemns murderers also condemns hatred. There is no mercy within the law itself. It condemns all who violated it and everyone is guilty of violating God's perfect standard. The law was not without glory, however, since it did come from God, it was glorious. 
Moses received the law on Mount Sinai from God himself. Moses was in the very presence of God. So much that Moses' face shone so bright from being in the glory of God that when he came down from the mount and stood in front of the Israelites, they were afraid of him and were unable to look at him because of the glory that shone over his face. The glory of the law, although was temporary, but however, Jesus would fulfill it in order to bring about the new covenant that all believers would be saved under. When Moses met with the Israelites because of his glory that he had and it shone so brightly in front of them, you know, that they were really afraid to even be in his presence. Can you imagine being in, being afraid to be in the presence of God? Um, Paul argues that if the ministry of death came with glory, Although it was coming to an end, the new covenant, how much greater would it would the ministry of the spirit be? Because the ministry of the spirit or the new covenant is internal and far more powerful than the old covenant. That it stands to reason that it far surpassed the old covenant in its glory. Paul refers to the new covenant as the ministry of righteousness. It was not a backup place for the old covenant, but the new covenant was prophesied centuries before it actually was inaugurated. The old covenant accomplished God's purpose in his overall plan of redemption, but salvation was never to be found in that law but salvation was to be found in christ christ is the reason the glory of the new covenant far exceeds the glory of the old covenant righteousness is much more greater than condemnation and life is preferred over death the new covenant brings freedom and liberty while the old covenant of the law brought about bondage and oppression. Jesus came to fulfill the old covenant, meaning that he satisfied all of its demands. In establishing the new covenant, Jesus did not add any new teachings or provisions to the existent law. He just completed, completed it and fulfilled it on our behalves, thereby instituting a covenant that is internal. Our next out, um, outline we will be discussing is the glory revealed and we will be discussing verses um, 12 through 18. And the word of the Lord reads, Seeing then that we have such hope, we used great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil should be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit 
and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from the glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Now, the new covenant brings forgiveness of sin, redemption from bondage, from sin, freedom in Christ, and liberty in the Holy Spirit. The old covenant brought none of these things. The new covenant is the everlasting testament that will never be replaced. The new covenant allows us to be bold in our faith because of Jesus Christ. Jesus secured that victory over sin for us on the cross. This is our hope in life and death. The cross where Jesus defeated the power of sin and darkness that once held, up, that once held the grips on us. The cross is the place where the old covenant ended and the new covenant began. Without the cross, there is no new covenant, no salvation, no forgiveness of sin. There would be no victory over sin, no victory over death, no victory in our lives, no victory in salvation. Moses had to put a veil on his face to protect the people from the radiant glory that shone from him. The people were terrified to come into the presence of God because they knew they had sinned. The veil on Moses' face showed that sinful man was not able to come in the presence of God and stand in his glory. The veil served as a shield that protected man from God's glory and spared him from God's judgment. But the fading glory of the old covenant shows us that it was incapable of providing reconciliation with God. Even today, when you think about it, when you're in church and when we're in the presence of God, um, people still don't have any respect for the presence of God. You know, in Moses' day, they were hiding from Moses. They didn't even want to be in the presence of the glory of God that was shown on Moses' face. Today, even in our churches, when, we're in, when the presence of God is there with us, and you look around, you see people on their cell phones, um, you see people having conversations with each other, you see people are interacting with their kids, they're doing anything else besides having due respect for the presence of God at that moment. They don't have any respect for the glory, glorifying God in his presence. What if we were under the old law? It would be justified to just strike us dead for, at any moment due to our sins. Tradition and old ways are very hard for many people to even set aside today. And this is especially true of the old covenant. Good works cannot give us salvation. Since some of us remain in a veil in our own hearts when we think about it. We won't remove the veil from our hearts. We won't remove the veils from our thinking. We won't remove the veils from our life to be able to be in God's glory, to be able to be in God's presence. The Israelites failed to see the glory of God under the old covenant. The new covenant is the only way for the veil to be removed. 
and that is to turn to Jesus Christ, who is the only one who can remove the veil away with the new covenant. With the new covenant, there is no bondage in the Holy Spirit. There is repentance for sinners. You can find the liberty that the law of the old covenant could not provide. The glory shown for Moses' face was temporal, but the glory that cometh from the Spirit would never fade or diminished. God's glory is everlasting. He paid a price on a cross for us to have these liberties, to be able to come to him, to be able to be in his presence, to be able to have the glory. So when we're thinking about the old covenant, it had to be really hard. Paul's point was not to diminish the glory of the old covenant, but rather to show the greatness of the glory of the new covenant, which is perfect and permanent. We get forgiveness of our sins. We get redemption from bondage of sin. We get freedom in Christ. And we get the liberty of having the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine living in those days um, where you had to wait to get atonement for your sin? How blessed are we now that we can have, um, we can usher in um, the presence of God and we have the Holy Spirit inside of us that we could be free from bondage. We can be free from sin if we only just believe and become in the presence of God. Um, we have to have belief. And we gain this through the new covenant which was not in the old covenant because in in order um in order for the new covenant to come about god had to die jesus had to die and the cross is very relevant to that day if it had not been for the cross and it had not been for Jesus dying for us on the cross, then the new covenant would have not came about. Well, that's all that um, I have for you today um, um, to talk about is the new covenant and the old covenant. If you take nothing away from today's lesson, and you take nothing away from today's topic, I pray that you thank God every day that we are living within the new covenant and not the old. Because I can't even imagine um, not being forgiven for our sins today, not being able to have the time, not being able to be able to go to Christ and to ask for our forgiveness of sin, um, especially through our thoughts, through our words, even through our deeds today. If it had not been for the new covenant, where would we be? Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this word that was put forth this, this morning. I pray, Father God, that someone will come to the realization, Father God, that Without Calvary, there would be no new covenant. We're thanking you for this new covenant. We're thanking you, Father God, for the remission of our sin. We're thanking you, Father God, today for giving us another chance through the new covenant, Father God, to be saved, Father God. A new chance, Father God, to have our sins diminished. Father, we thank you for those who will be viewing this. I pray, Father God, for their families in advance, Father God, I pray, Father God, that someone would get to know you, Father God, through this lesson today. We thank you, Father God, for the remission of our sins. Thank you for being who you are, Jesus Christ. Thank you for being our beginning and thank you for being our ending today. 
It is in the mighty name, mighty matchless name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen.